Uh, hello, this is uh, Pastor Mueller again, here with uh, Pastor Joshua Cook of Our Savior in Louisville, who is also Lutheran. And uh, uh, as we've done in the past, we, uh, we had a conversation with uh, Pastor Gugenti from Shelbyville a little while ago, and this is uh, like that. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Lutheran schools and Lutheran education. Uh, before we go too far, uh, both Pastor Cook and I are Lutheran pastors, and uh, we've subscribed to the Book of Concord and the Scriptures. Uh, I don't anticipate that we'll say anything heretical, but if we do, we don't intend to. <laughs> so I'm just uh, throwing that, that out there as a uh, disclaimer. Uh, these are our own opinions, I suppose, but uh, we're not we're not trying to say anything controversial, I think. But uh, Okay, Pastor Cook, you are pastor of... Yeah, I'm pastor of Our Savior Lutheran uh, here in, in Louisville. Um, I've been working on a PhD down here in Louisville, and uh, my wife and, and six children and I uh, attended Our Savior just looking for a, uh, a church to join when we moved from uh, East Point, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. Um, and... Um, we attended one Sunday and, and kept coming back, and um, eventually the pastor that was here when we first moved down here retired, and they asked me uh, to fill in a little bit on Sundays until they could call somebody, and after a while of um, not being able to call anyone, um, they they decided to try and call me against, against my uh, protestations. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but, e but eventually, uh, God, uh, God in his wisdom um, softened my heart to the idea of taking a call, and I've been here for about two years now. And that, that's kind of similar to how I ended up at uh, Risen Lord in Peace. I was preaching there for a year before, uh, before I was called full-time, but uh, yeah. So. Yeah, well, I've, I've been really blessed um, to be a member of this congregation, and... Um, you know, this is the third congregation that I've had with a with a Lutheran school, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of guys in seminaries they don't want to be pastors of um, of congregations that have Lutheran schools because they've heard that it's it's difficult, that um, it's a drain on the finances and and all of that. And I certainly was of that opinion while going through. Uh, the seminary. I didn't. I told um, the placement director I had no no desire to be placed in a congregation with a school. And um, Dr. Fakencher laughed and placed me in a congregation with a school. He has a way of doing that. He does. He <laughs> does. So, <laughs> he takes so, suggestions and ignores them. <laughs> so I, I was uh, end up being very uh, very thankful that Dr. Fakencher uh, was led by the Spirit to to place me there because, like I said, every congregation that I've served in since has had a Lutheran school, and I have just grown uh, absolutely passionate about. Um, Lutheran education and um, and our call as congregations to um, to serve uh, our members in that way. Uh, now, quite a few of my folks uh, were probably former members of uh, before it was a resurrection. I'm blanking on the name, but uh, there was a school attached to it, Martin Luther Lutheran School, and a lot of either. Either my members or their children went to that school, but risen Lord, a lot of my folks uh, uh, probably didn't even grow up Lutheran, and so aren't really familiar with uh, the, uh, I would say the, the history of Lutheran education so much. But Lutheran schools have, especially in the Missouri Synod, have been a large part of what Lutheran churches do. Is that? Yeah, that's that's absolutely accurate. Um, you know, Martin Luther, even as he's writing the small catechism after the visitation, um, you know, and then a little bit more formally after that. But as he's writing the small education or the small catechism, he 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 writes the words, you know, as the head of the household should teach in simple words to his children. Um, and so for Martin Luther, he. He understood and taught um, his followers, uh, what really Christ's followers, to take seriously the call of Christ um, to 
not only baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but to teach them all that I have commanded you. And um, he understood that to be part of the identity of, of Christian parents, that um, to be Christian meant that you were educators and that it was your God-given responsibility, vocation, to be teaching the faith. And um, in a in an evangelical world um, where some bad theology sometimes reigns, um, the once saved, always saved, Theology um, can sometimes make us feel like, okay, once my child has said, I believe in Jesus, and I really don't have anything more um, other to teach them other than to just, you know, start to practice, um, practice being a good Christian. Um, and I think to, when the church does that, we, we fall into an error that we really do um, need to be every single day learning what it is to be um, to be a child of God um, it's not just an intellectual knowledge it's a it's a heart soul and mind um, acceptance of who we are as God's people his chosen people of Israel and so there's there's Old Testament roots um, of um, of Christian education because of what God taught even the Old Testament saints. Yeah, you, you uh, something you were talking about before we started recording. Uh, I was thinking of the, the, the institution of the Passover, and there's that phrase uh, that God tells Moses, and then when your children ask you, what, what do you mean by this, then you explain to them the Exodus, and you tell them these stories that you, your children are part of, even though they weren't there for the Exodus, that they are, this is their history, and they are part of Israel. Yeah. Education is moving you, it is making you part of a group, right? It is. It, it, it's conforming you into this image. It's teaching you your, your identity, your family heritage, what you have inherited from God. Um, it's not based on your merit or worthiness, but on God's having chosen you. And that was true of the people of Israel. It's true of us in the New Testament. Um, through the waters of baptism, Jesus calls us by name, and he places his name upon us. And, um, you know, so often in the Old Testament, whether it was when they would uh, cross the Jordan River and set up the, the, the 12 rocks on top of one another so that there was this physical... Uh, symbol, this sign that says this is where God did something important and then that instruction to to remember what had been done, to recount it to the, the subsequent generations um, and you know when Jesus uses that term um, do this in remembrance of me in the new covenant um, it's more than just a, a fond thinking back to but it is a, a recounting and a living out of the reality of what Christ has done and so uh, like I said I think, um, I think God has instructed the Israelites and therefore us the new Israel um, through the simple words of even uh, what the Jewish people would call the Shema, uh, found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Uh, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down, and when you rise. Uh, that just strikes me as um, it's so foundational to, um, to who the people of Israel are and, con and who we continue to be. It begins with just the, hear, O Israel, like Jesus standing outside of, of Lazarus's tomb and saying, Lazarus, come forth. Um, it was God's proclamation to someone, um, in this case, the the whole multitude of Israel, hear, O Israel. It was his, his voice, his word that called them into existence, that gathered a people together that were formerly not a people, and now, by God's 
um, performative word are gathered as a congregation and become something new, Israel. And they, they exist in, in his word, in his calling, and he promises them, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, and so it's, it's our God. This is this voice of God calls us together and then promises that he is our God. And then um, kind of and in a resultant way says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Um, this is what it is to be the people of God. Um, we remember Jesus' parable um, after the woman who... Um, the woman that was a sinner that uh, came to the Pharisees' dinner and ended up washing Jesus' feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. Um, Jesus, Jesus instructed um, that the one, the one who has been forgiven much is the one who, who loves much. Um, and um, when we when we are called together as the people of God and recognize that it is solely out of his divine goodness and mercy that we have standing before God and that we get to call him ours, um, then we certainly cling to this one who has been so merciful, who has clothed us with his righteousness, and we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And because of that, um, th then we want to not only know what he has taught and know what he has, has commanded, we, don't, we want to follow in his footsteps, but we want to bring the same life-giving um, heritage to, to our children. And, and in fact, that's what he instructs us to do. Um, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. In other words, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, just be talking constantly, be forming your children all the time. Um, it doesn't mean that, like, there's a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week um, you know, Sunday school lesson. It's that in everything that you're doing, um, allow allow this to be an opportunity that you are that you are teaching those around you how we uh, live and move and have our being in God, and how that love and uh, has redefined us and helps us to see the world through through new eyes. And I think Christian education. Um, is rooted all the way back here in this in this um, calling together of the people of God. It's a it's an outflowing of who we are as God's people. It's a responsibility of parents to educate or to see to the education of their children into the community of of God, which in the Old Testament is Israel for us is the church with the big C church, I guess, or the Lutheran church. Right, absolutely. And so, you know, for we've, we can find these roots of Christian education back here in the calling together of the people of Israel and the Shema, but um, then we, uh, for the New Testament, I mean, again, we're just highlighting some of the, the high points here. Um, the, the scripture is replete with instruction for us to be teaching, um, but you know, even even in the fundamental um, calling together of the New Testament church in in the instruction to um, to baptize, uh, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them." to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, right, well, but as a parent, I would say, pastor, you know, we have Sunday school. Uh, me and the kids, we say our prayers before we go to bed. We pray before meals. Uh, they've gone through confirmation. They've, 
partially memorize the catechism, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the public schools are pretty good, and uh, someday I want my kids to, I want them to make six figures or whatever. They're going to be an engineer or a lawyer. they got to go to a fancy school somewhere. What's, you know, what's the, what's the advantage of, why pay all this money to, to go to this uh, Lutheran school, you know, if they're, you know. Yeah, well, I think that's I think that's a, a question that's um, commonly posed to pastors around the synod, um, and it's a it's just kind of um, it it comes from a, st- a pragmatic stance. I mean, education is expensive, and why um, why pay double for education? Our taxes pay for public schools, and we know lots of um, kids that do well and succeed in this life, um, having been educated in public schools. We have our own members, our teachers in the public schools. And so are, are we saying that um, God is, is anti-public school? Uh, my, my response to that would be absolutely not. God is not anti-public school, and he certainly calls um, some, some people to serve in the public school, and we're, we're grateful for that. That vocation is, is absolutely necessary. However, I think that we do um, we do have to understand that um, modern modern education and the and the public school is born out of a, a out of a philosophy. Of course, it is. Um, it was um, back in the Reformation era. It was the era. It was the Lutherans that were committed to making sure that all children were educated. Um, and and so they undertook um, to make sure that that um, all of the children of the parish uh, were were educated at the church's expense, um, and it wasn't until um, really post World War II, uh, maybe a little bit before that, um, that the idea that it's the state's uh, responsibility to um, educate children, um, that that became a a popular understanding. Um, The problem is when the state decided to begin to educate children, it it, um, believes, or believed, I think it believes it more now than than formerly, um, that it could just teach the facts, just just the numbers, just the letters, um, just, just the books, um, and not um, not teach any theology or morality or worldview with it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, there there always is going to be a worldview and a philosophy communicated as um, as subjects or are being taught. And to try to go about um, the the task of educating um, in a godless way. Um, not not saying that they're trying to be anti-God or anything, but the the hypothesis that you can educate um, with um, by and at the same time pull God out of the picture ends up being a a godless worldview that then inculcates a way of looking at the world um, without God, um, and so there is a there is a worldview, there is a theology that comes along with even learning just your numbers and um, the sciences and the reading and writing and all of that, if that's done without, um, without the understanding of how God has made the world and how Christ has redeemed the world, how the Holy Spirit calls and gathers all, all people to himself, um, then, then really, the, um, a, a key component of hearing as the people of God, as the Israel um, that we are, His chosen, is missing. And then everything that we're doing as we rise up and lay down, as we walk and sit, and all of that of the Shema ends up being done in instead of in. Um, in God's realm and, and, and helping us to make these connections across disciplines and seeing how um, all truth belongs to God, 
the author and perfecter of all things and of our faith, then this other, um, this other worldview ends up taking root. And unfortunately, what we see then is um, not, not terribly surprising. Now, I think Pew Research says that something like 66% of children that are brought up in the church uh, will, by the time they have their own families, cease to go to church. Um, and that's in part, I think, uh, due to the fact that we aren't, um, parents have um, partially abdicated um, teaching their children. They are helping them on Sundays go to Sunday school and go to church and, and throughout the week saying prayers and things like that, but it's not, it's not um, teaching them in all things at all times, and so it silos off religion and faith and Christianity and our identity as God's children. It silos that off into something that we do privately, and it doesn't permeate everything that we do which is what um, the Shema is, is asking us to, um, to do. It sort of goes to, um, as parents, as Christians, how we view our own, uh, our own life in the church. Is what you're saying, is church a thing that I do one hour a week or maybe two hours if you're lucky, and then I live the rest of my secular life at work, at home, uh, and then church becomes, is it, is it worthwhile for me or not, and do I find the church that is somehow helping whatever problem I think I have and so on, or is my identity first as a Christian and a member of this community first, and then whatever I do in the secular world is secondary? I think that's kind yeah, of Yeah, well, question. and I think that, I mean, what getting back to like the parent that's going to ask you know I want my child to make six figures or more and be successful and um, you know have opportunities to play these um, sports and everything like that um, I mean part of what they're part of what they are revealing as they are asking questions along those lines is that perhaps um, perhaps they are beginning to um, imbibe the world's understanding of, of success uh, more heavily than they even realize. And so um, the question it becomes, um, you know, do, do you th want someone that doesn't believe in God to be responsible for your child's uh, partnering with you for your child's eternal uh, life um, and the security in that life or would you like someone who uh, has been called and commissioned by God for this specific uh, purpose um, who is um, ready and willing um, to be used by God and you to continue to disciple your child in the faith that says you know making six figures is all well and good, being a successful volleyball or basketball player is great, um, but it's not the highest good. And um, that, that those things cannot be allowed in the Christian's life to become, to become the highest good, or else um, we really have um, forgotten um, whom we have been purchased uh, by. Yeah. Um, uh, that makes me think of a few points. First of all, that uh, a secular school is not just uh, neutral. It is, every school is preparing you for some community, right? So if you're not going to a church school, you're, you're going to a school that's preparing you for some other, some other life, some other community. Uh, second thing is, uh, it's not uh, it's not so much the curriculum necessarily, or what goes on in the classroom, or what's in the textbook, but what goes on in the bus ride. Who do you have lunch with? What is the general tone and tenor? Who are the people that you are around? This is maybe what. 
Yeah, I think what there's it's about. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And there look, there are there are wonderful people in the public school and um, and wonderful educations have been uh, had by many uh, good solid Christians from the public school um, that being that being said um, that is of course um, part of, of God's grace and um, it's something that we can thank him for um, and yet there's kind of there's kind of choices um, in our lives between good better and best and public school I think can be a good choice for some um, and it certainly is going to expose you to people um, good people in the um, in the public school system who um, who understand civil righteousness very well um, but the difference in in the Christian's life between um, someone who is civilly righteous and depends upon you know their their um, outward righteousness um, that they're a good person and someone who with your child daily confesses that we are sinful and unclean um, that we cannot merit heaven by ourselves that isn't teaching just a morality um, but rather um, is is helping um, by um, by the the office of the ministry that they are holding um, and, and supporting, they are helping to form your children in their baptismal faith. Um, they are teaching them to confess. It's not about our outward righteousness. It is about this alien righteousness that we receive from Christ alone. Um, and and we, we need to be reminded of that on a daily basis. And, and that, um, as we learn who we are in Christ, and also have opportunity to be studying just the, the general subjects of school. Um, it's um, it's that math isn't um, you know more more or less uh, Christian in and of itself, depending on which building you're in. But um, in the Christian school. Um, you're able to not just do math and then sprinkle some Jesus on top, um, but it's um, this. How does this? How does doing this math help us to understand the world that we live in? And how does that reveal um, God's orderliness? And um, and there's a law and gospel application there too our our own disorderliness the disorderliness of the world and you know the answers and those those things don't those things those aren't written out in questions or something in a math book but they are opportunities that Christians um, working with students and teaching them to remember the one God um, throughout the day have those opportunities um, to to make those connections, and those are um, those are so important in the formation of faith, um, ongoing each and every day. This maybe an answers this question, but uh, well, you know, say for instance, I am a parent and I do care about my kids' uh, uh, spiritual well-being. What? Why not Catholic school or uh, evangelical? general Christian school. I mean, they yeah. talk about Jesus, they got crosses on the walls, what's... Uh... They absolutely do, and, and I don't want to, you know, throw throw fellow Christians under the bus or anything, but certainly Lutherans and um, the Reformed Evangelicals or the Catholics do have some, some theological uh, differences, and so I think there is a uniqueness to Lutheran education um, that doesn't see Jesus as a second Moses, a new lawgiver, um, but rather um, teaches that we are justified uh, by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And so the, the proper distinction between law and gospel that is understood and is a commitment that we Lutherans have in our in our faith as we and as we teach it to one another is as an awful important 
um, distinction. As a Lutheran pastor, of course, I believe this, but but I think I just practically it has a, a, a real world consequences um, that you can go to the um, Catholic schools and you can go to the Reform schools and you can come out knowing an awful lot about about God and God's word. Um, you can you can look uh, civilly righteous um, and and you can certainly even have a, a, a true faith in, in Christ. Um, but you, you've been taught through the rules and, and the, um, the theology classes that um, our primary purpose as Christians is to fulfill the law. Um, and we, um, and so Christ as the fulfillment of the law and Christ's um, emptying of himself for us so that um, you know we love because he first loved us. When we have the opportunity to talk about law and gospel in the Lutheran Church and when we get to talk about grace and how that how that impacts us as God's children. We're not we're not ruled by by guilt, or by um, or by trying to become these perfect people, um, and will, um, but rather understand that we are beggars uh, that come into God's presence empty-handed, um, but receive out of His generosity all that we need for life and salvation and um, are filled with his love and then commissioned and sent to go out and share that love. And so the Lutheran understanding of, of justification, of sanctification, of vocation, um, you know, is, is so important. And I think that's one of the great um, strengths of Lutheran education is that, um, is that it understands the early years of education, I'm talking about kindergarten through 12th grade, really, as the, the basic training of being a Christian. Um, you know, I, as a former soldier, um, you know, basic training was, was only eight weeks of, of my, my life in the eight years of Army. But had I been sent to the front line without it, I would have more than likely become a casualty. Um, it was absolutely foundational to who I was as a soldier to have gone through the proper, the proper training. And I've heard, I've heard the argument that while Christians should be um, willing to send their children into the public school because it's there that they can be salt and light. Um, but I think that I would push back against that and say that's like sending a soldier to the front line without any, without any training. In order to be light to the world, you you need to um, you need to be formed as as the candle, uh, and that candle needs to be needs to be lit. And um, the the Lutheran education is it's not just about your one, two, threes, and ABCs. It's so much more than that. It is about faith formation. Um, and that faith needs to be, uh, it needs to be enkindled and grown, nurtured, so that, yes, um, prepared after a number of years, they can go out into the world and, and be that. Um, that light and not be ashamed of the gospel and know that gospel thoroughly so that they can they can proclaim it unashamedly um, but that doesn't that doesn't happen overnight even for Jesus's uh, called disciples they were with him for three full years every single day um, learning what it was to be a disciple of Christ um, our children our children need to be discipled uh, that's a that's an interesting subject. Uh, so now maybe we're not going to talk about Lutheran schools specifically for a moment. But I have a question. Uh, catechesis is a word that you probably use. <laughs> maybe not everybody knows what that means, but it means basically training 
at least the way I think of it, training for the kingdom, how to be a member of God's, God's kingdom. Uh, other denominations, whether Catholic or other Protestants, it seems to me that training is, here is a list of behaviors that Christians do, or more likely, here are a list of things that you cannot do if you are a Christian, and then trying to inculcate that into kids' skulls. It seems like Lutheranism, what you're getting at, is not just, although there are behaviors and so forth that we'd like them to do, it's not really about X, Y, and Z, don't do this, do this, and behavior. Yeah, it's not so much a, um, a learning a learning a set of rules and learning how to stay squeaky clean, um, but rather um, understanding that um, th- that our morality flows out of um, who we are in Christ Jesus, and so there are and we expect as Christians to to bear fruit in keeping with uh, righteousness. Um, but it's it's fruit that flows out of our character as those redeemed by Christ the crucified, and so any anybody, even a non-believer, can can learn a list of rules and then try their very hardest to follow those rules and outwardly appear to be quite quite righteous. Um, however, in the Lutheran uh, Church, we we take God's word seriously that it isn't our outward righteousness that um, that saves that um, and so the vast majority of the time spent in um, in reflection upon God's word in Lutheran schools ought to be um, understanding who we are in Christ um, understanding our utter sinfulness and our inability really to be to be righteous apart from God that um, all of our righteous misses are as filthy rags and yet when when we are uh, baptized into Christ Jesus he clothes us in the robes of his righteousness and he places his spirit within us um, so that as um, as people made in God's image, now we are restored um, and given the Holy Spirit as a counselor, a comforter who teaches us um, to do all that he has commanded us. Um, and But that isn't, um, it's not that we're doing these things in order to become the children of God, That, but that because we are the children of God, this is uh, flowing naturally out of this new life that is in us. Um, that the Holy Spirit is is daily engendering in us this faith that clings to Christ alone. And um, that goes against everything that the natural man believes. And all other religions of the world will teach this this legalism, this, this law-based um, righteousness. And one of the tremendous graces of the Reformation was that Martin Luther was able to uh, to point people to God's word and to show them that um, that God's word has taught a way of salvation that is not based upon works righteousness not based upon the law but affirms what all of scripture does that our our um, calling as the people of God, as God's Israel, rests solely on um, the free gift of, of Christ Jesus um, and our, our trust in him uh, to, be, uh, to be called his children. Uh, maybe I'm misremembering my uh, Old Testament, but uh, the great Shema, the statement, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. I believe that is sort of the foundational statement for what comes in the Ten Commandments and the rest of the yes, yeah, the behaviors that Israelites are supposed to do. The first point, though, is here is who God is, and then your identity is based on who He is. Absolutely, and what, how you live is based on who He is. So the identity of who Christ is is the first. This is the first lesson, and that's. I mean, it's overstating it, but this is almost the only lesson. 
you know, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, it may be overstating it, and you know me well enough to know that I, I love overstatement. But, um, you know, I, I am, I'm willing to say to, to my people, you know, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, tongue um, is, is there really anything more important that you can teach your children other than Jesus Christ and him crucified? Yeah. Um, like they can be, they can be a, a millionaire. They can be a world famous, uh, you know, baseball player, volleyball player, what have you. But in the end, if they don't know Jesus Christ, um, what what's it all for? Right. Uh, we're, we're, we are promised by God's word that this world will will pass away, and that uh, those that are apart from Christ Jesus will um, be told, "Depart from me, I never knew you." And what, what horrifying things to hear as an individual and as a parent of six um, to imagine that that could be uh, said of, of my children is uh, something that I go to God routinely about and pray that um, I would not become a stumbling block to my children, but that I would be used as, as God's instrument to um, help them to remember who they are and remember what... What, what Christ has done for them so that they would put their trust in, in him alone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, public schools are certainly not going to teach you that, and other Christian schools may or may not, but it is certainly, that's just not their identity the way it is for the Lutheran, the Lutheran church. That the identity of Christ and his the truth of who he is is central to to who you are and hopefully who your children are going to be. I think when the Lutheran school understands itself rightly, um, it is committed to um, it is committed to the Reformation principles. It's committed to God's word alone. It's committed to faith alone, um, Christ alone. All all of these things are are so important that. And so, um, so important for us as parents, and not just parents, but um, as the body of Christ. So, um, you know, Luther recognizes that it's um, the head of the household, it's the father's responsibility to teach his children. But then he also expands that to, the, uh, to be a responsibility of the church. And I would say that in God's address, to hear, O Israel, he is speaking collectively to the people of Israel. Yes, to individual parents and, and highlighting their responsibility to teach their children, but also to the whole, the whole people of Israel. So you may not have, um, you may not have children, and yet as the people of Israel, you are called to make sure that all of the people of Israel know these truths. Um, and as Luther uh, understands education, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first person of responsibility is the father, is the parents, but close behind them is the extended, the extended family of God's church. And so it's the whole church that's responsible for this. And, and Lutheran education rightly understood and why it was that they were so committed to making sure that that Lutheran education was was free of charge to, to all of the children of the community was that they understood this um, as part of their identity and, and part of their commissioning. They could do no other. They, it wasn't an option for them. This was what they were, were called to do. Um, we've seen a number of Lutheran schools. Uh, I would we're pushing a majority of Lutheran schools almost have have closed in the recent in recent decades, um, in part um, because I think we have begun to forget um, instead of remembering who we are and remembering um, why education is foundational to everything that we are as God's people. We've begun to forget and we've begun to treat. Lutheran schools as if they are um, businesses, um, and their mission um, has become to educate, but kind of accepting the world's understanding of education and siloing it off, perhaps, um, from our identity in Christ, 
um, and maybe even looking at um, at Lutheran schools or early childhood centers as um, businesses that we can run kind of standalone that may perhaps attract people to churches. Um, and so then the, that means, if you peel back all of the layers and everything, that the, the purpose of a Lutheran school or an early childhood center would be to um, grow the church, to um, increase membership and thereby revenues. And if a ch school isn't doing that, then it's a it's a failed effort, and we ought to just uh, set it aside and find a new venture that will attract people to the church and grow its numbers. The problem is there, instead of being um, in line with the mission that we have from God, the commission that we have from him to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded you, even to the uttermost parts of the earth, instead of teaching people about Jesus, its mission being solely teach people about Jesus, now it has become bring people to the church so that the church can grow, and Jesus is kind of an afterthought. And that's, that is a forsaking of, um, of who we are as God's people. Um, it's tangential to the point of the church. And the point of the church and the point of Christian schools ought to be one and the same thing, Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, I would say, to add on that, uh, schools, I don't know if it's, it has to do with paying teachers and health care and retirement benefits and that sort of thing. It's an expensive business. And... Uh, uh, I think in some some cities, the only way a school can can go is that congregations in the area cooperate. I know our Savior has kind of taken the whole burden here with your school, but uh, but there's a lack of cooperation amongst congregations. Churches don't trust each other for whatever reason. Seems like this is an example. <laughs> I'm thinking of a specific example that I won't go into, but. Uh, uh, Basically, the emphasis is just not understood, and it's not it's not there amongst. Well, and I think that 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 flows out of a, a misunderstanding of the mission of schools too. Right. That when that schools, they're going to get all those people, and why should I support their school? That they're just going to go to their exactly, church. Exactly. Exactly. Instead of seeing ourselves as fellow believers and the one body of Christ serving the one Lord of Israel, right. um, we, we begin to see each other as competitors and a school is a way that I can attract people away from other congregations and that, that, uh, that is a pernicious um, error that Satan has um, introduced and injected into the relationship of, um, of Lutheran churches, and we need to find ways that we can combat that and reject, reject the lies and reject that error. That, um, you know, and some of that has to do with, um, with tuition and, and charging members versus non-member fees and things like that, and we need to work together to uh, find ways that we can that we can cooperate it does cost money of course to operate a, a, a school um, and um, and if there's ways that we can work with um, churches um, to help cover those costs um, we, we should do that um, and we should um, share in, in this work um, and not insist on reinventing the work wheel in each location that certainly for efficiency sake and everything like that would be would be folly as churches um, but if we're working together in partnership for the gospel um, and we're not looking to steal one another sheep and things like that but really are invested in um, in teaching our children who they are in Christ Jesus and there's creative ways that we can uh, partner together for the gospel, um, and um, and I would really love to uh, see us get back to a, a tuition 
tuition free um, opportunities. Uh, not, uh, not that the that school would be free, but that churches would be committed to covering the costs 100% for anyone, um, members and, and yes, even people from outside the community, um, because it's that important. This really is eternal life that we're talking about here. And, um, you know, part of, um, part of Israel being Israel, of course, they were taught to, to tithe and things like that because there was a, a real, a real world pragmatic cost to taking care of people, and there is in the church too. But you know, the church has shied away from um, teaching and, and believing and practicing a uh, a financial responsibility towards one another, and um, I, I just without sharing any of the specifics, um, you know, I've served in congregations um, who if you just took the median income of, um, of that area, and many of the congregations that I've served, the people that are um, in those congregations have well above the medium income, median income. But if you did, if you just extrapolate extrapolated across the congregation, everybody making the median income, um, and if they were giving a, a tithe of that income, the church uh, and school would have six times uh, more than it was necessary to, uh, to operate, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is, many, many people nowadays um, are giving two to three percent um, and and we aren't calling one another to faithfulness on this. That's that's wrong. Um, and because uh, we have accepted false gods, the false gods of prosperity, um, then then we aren't willing to sacrifice um, for the sake of the neighbor. And we tell ourselves uh, we tell ourselves lies that we've. We've done our part, um, and by paying taxes, we've provided a public school education, and so we ought not have to pay more so that they can uh, know Jesus. And I uh, quite obviously reject <laughs> reject that logic. <laughs> well, we know where your paycheck comes from. No, uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, we're kind of come to the end here. I think... Whether we're talking about tithing or sending your kids to Lutheran school or just supporting it without having kids, um, the, the, I think the question is the same. Is the secular life that public school prepares you for that you're living day by day, is this the only life there is or do you belong to something else? Is there more than this that Lutheran schools another life that a Lutheran school does prepare you for, and that truth of who Christ is, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when do you, you really believe about, that? And if you do, then maybe you support it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, they're, you know, the people of Israel uh, were craftsmen just like the people of, of Canaan of their day. Um, they, you know, they learned a lot of the same trades and everything like that. But... Um, it wasn't it wasn't their trades that made them unique. It was their their identity in in the one true God and the promises that they clung to and believed. And um, we can send our kids to um, to public schools and they can learn vocations there and they can go on to to higher education and and be trained for even bigger and, and better things and, and have even more earning potential. But if in the end um, they, they leave behind their identity um, because it, it was never really um, just weaved into their, their personality, their understanding of who they are, their identity, um, then, then it will continue to just remain um, siloed and and perhaps even neglected as they as they go on to bigger and better things um, because um, for them as they b continue to uh, drink from the world's definition of what of what success and prosperity is um, it I mean make no doubt about it Satan is teaching them 
things. <laughs> he's daily trying to teach them to remember his lies. And one of the things that Lutheran school does and that parents and godparents and nieces, nephews need aunts and uncles that, that just keep pushing back against Satan and his lies and, and teaching them rather uh, the things the things of God, the promises of God, so that um, their their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations in life don't become identical with the things that Satan wants, um, which is that we would all perish apart from Christ, but rather um, that everything that we do is um, in in our salvation in Christ is in view, and um, we are we are in a constant state of remembering it, and we're in a constant state of helping others remember that. Um, that's that's what I think Lutheran school does so well, and prepares people so well for the rest of their lives, so that you know the next generation of Christians are being taught to remember. Um, Remember God's commandments, remember God's graces, God's promises. Um, understand this distinction of law and gospel um, and how, how it is that we as the, the children of God truly do um, find our, our rest, our peace, which surpasses understanding in Christ alone. Thank you, Pastor Cook. Thank you, John. I appreciate you taking the time today. Okay, we'll see you.